Mark LaBelle from Dirty Honey is with us on the show. Mark, two people in a week said to me a couple months ago, you got to hear Dirty Honey in a week. And I said, okay, let me check it out. Immediately, I said, I am fucking all over this. And by the way, you can curse on this show. This is more conversational than interview. All right. That's my style. I, I, I saw some of your YouTube shit, so I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, uh, I drop a few F bombs here and there on the, uh, <laughs> at the live show. Yeah, and I love that, man. I saw some live. You just live... get excited, man, you know? Well, yeah, as you should, man. Yeah. As you should. Um, so I listened to, you know, the first thing obviously I heard is when I'm gone, and I said, this fucking band is right up my alley man yeah so i immediately listened to every song on the ep which i love your ep was released in march 2009 which you recorded in australia with nick didia who is a big time producer how did yeah. you guys get nick didia to produce your album the song made its way over to nick our manager sent it over to him and and uh he like immediately wrote back to him like i think this is a hit song um what's the deal with these guys like would they be interested in you know thinking outside of the box and traveling to australia to come record with me so So, if a guy like nick didia is showing interest in you that says a lot man yeah he um he's a pretty legendary rock and roll you know engineer and producer now and and uh, we started looking at more of his current stuff with, with Powderfinger. Um, mm-hmm. It was a huge band in Australia. And we had a conversation with him over Skype and, and with his producing partner and really vied with those two guys. And, um, yeah, it went, it went, the conversations over the Internet were really good, and we just felt really comfortable with him. Now, did you have the all the songs in the EP? Because I understand you have a lot of unrecorded uh material in the camp. yeah we have a lot of like you know like anything like it's it's the last 10 percent that's like the hardest to really get done like yeah. we, have a, we have a ton of like really great ideas and um riffs and melodies like ready to go but once you finishing stuff really finishing it and like getting it to 100 percent is the hard part i know i don't have to tell you this but in one month when i'm gone and this is just in the last month. When yeah. I'm Gone has gone from 5,000 streams a month ago to a million streams. That's, That's crazy. incredible. And Fire Away actually has a quarter million streams, which is not on the album, which you put out in 2018 as a single. Is that correct? Yeah, that was, that was just a self-produced um, effort here in L.A., and... You know, we knew we had to take a shot, really, with our original stuff um, at some point. And at the time, that was, you know, When I'm Gone was already done, but we hadn't recorded it. And, um, yeah, we we recorded Fire Away at, at uh, NRG Studios up in the Valley. And, um, you know, put it out and just wanted to see what would happen. And uh, that, that was when everything sort of started taking a more professional turn, you know. The band is based in L.A., yeah, I live in LA now, but I'm from okay. upstate New York. Yeah. Did you move out there to try to get this this band going to get a rock thing going? How'd that come about? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think a lot of people moved to LA with a dream, and that was mine. And you know, I, I got you got to make money. So you know, my voice isn't isn't a very like hireable voice for like sidemen work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a ton of people that move out to try and start a rock band or something. They get caught up, you know, playing for Ariana Grande or some shit. And it's right. like, you know, that's not, that wasn't their focus when they moved out. And they just sort of get lost in the sideband world. And fortunately, like, I couldn't, I don't have the ability to do that. I'm not like a background. I'm not good at singing backgrounds and harmony. So um, I was kind of forced to make this thing work, you know. Yeah, well, you do have a very unique voice. There's no doubt about that. So, what did you guys do? Hit the clubs out there? Like, like, yeah, give, we give me the time. Specifically, we just because you've only been John. together like what, like two years, right? Yeah, I met John a couple couple more years ago than that, but um, he, he and I sort of met first, and 
um, pretty quickly like started working on original material and then you know it took a few years to find the right group of guys um but we would gig doing cover gigs and shit like all over la anywhere that would pay us like four or five hundred bucks like we would play for you know four hours a night you know they would give us free food and a couple hundred bucks like that that Mm -hmm. was enough to you know to coerce us into to playing um but yeah pretty quickly like we became a pretty reputable like cover band in LA and you sort of hone your, your sound and your skill together and start writing songs. And then, and then that was, once we got Corey in the band, um, that was when everything sort of started shifting to, all right, let's work on this original content. Let's finish off your drummer. Ideas. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, once you start, once you start finishing songs and like shooting some videos and stuff, um, things things start to fall in your favor and obviously i think the world is a little bit more ready for rock and roll than they were maybe five ten years ago yeah i agree so now then you go you record the album how did it go from playing clubs to opening for the who guns and roses now slash you're doing a lot of festivals how did that come about well you know we have a great manager who's been doing this for a long time and he's worked with you know, everybody from the Black Crows and Aerosmith and Coldplay to, you know, to, I mean, he's the guy that, like, signed Who's your manager? At, uh, Mark Didia. So his okay. brother is Nick. Yes. Who, who never really came up in this producing conversation until, because we really wanted to go to Detroit and, like, we thought that was a cool so like, you, idea. So you met Mark before you met Nick. I've, I've known Mark for a long time. Ah, okay. Yep, yep. And he and I actually play hockey together in L.A. And uh, he always kind of had one ear, you know, listening to us. And he would pop into shows from time to time. But, you know, his whole thing is like, I need to hear great songs. And if you're playing covers at a club, that doesn't really interest a record guy, you know? Right. He's like, what are you guys working on? And, And I played When I'm Gone for him. We had a demo of it. And he was just kind of like, what the fuck is that? And why haven't I heard it yet? You know, he played it for a guy at his office who was a radio guy. And he was like, that's a hit. That's a hit song for sure. Like, why? What, who is that? What's going on? And then, then I got the call. Like, you know, I think I think I want to do this with you guys. Let's go. Because we had been fishing around for other management and stuff. And, you know, in the back of my head, Mark has always been the only guy that I wanted yeah. to do it. He's, you know. When you listen to Dirty Honey and, and you know, you know, sort of our influences, like this is the guy that made all our influences successes. So it's like, it's a very easy fit. And, you know, we were meeting with other people that manage bands that we didn't necessarily love, but we love Guns N' Roses. We love Aerosmith. We love Led Zeppelin. And we love, you know, 90s grunge rock and shit like that. Mm-hmm. We're not, you know. There's more modern bands that don't really fit our style as well. So it was, he's the man too, man. Like he's just such a legend. So Okay, well that explains that. So now, where did you come up with the name of the band Dirty Honey? Because it's a great fucking name. Yeah, thanks. We, um, yeah, we, we've been working on names for a long time. Um, just banking like any idea into this like notes um, app on my phone. And, you know, I just remember listening to Howard Stern talking to Robert Plant about the honey drippers. And I was like, man, I would just love to have like a dirty fucking sounding name like that. And then voila, like I write these two words, dirty honey, into this notes app that we have. And uh, we were all looking at it one night like, fuck, we got to change this name. Like, do any of these appeal to us? And dirty honey was like the obvious winner kind of rolls off the tongue. And then our... um graphic artists made this fucking awesome logo. Yeah, that the logo's cool. Just so like perfectly like perfect imagery to describe what we are and uh, it became it became a thing like pretty quickly. So you know it's funny because I heard the name and I and I didn't really think of it that way. And then I was playing you guys on my show, you know, so I'm talking about just as a brand new band. I'm like, dirty honey. And then once it rolled out of my mouth I went Wait a second, <laughs> I go, that's a great name. You yeah, know, man. like Dirty it's... Honey. I didn't think about it till I actually, you know, was recording and I said it. 
that honestly, that's like the hardest thing is coming up with a name that everybody agrees with and everybody feels like fits the the sound. That was the hardest thing. I mean, that took years to, to find the right. I believe it, man, because I always say there's a lot to be said in a band name. I mean, there's some names and I'm just like, that name sucks or that's right. a great name. You sound like Dirty Honey. And that's what it's all about is sounding like your own band. So it doesn't sound like you're ripping anybody off. But like, right. for instance, Rolling Sevens has a little bit of an Aerosmith boogie to it. Oh, you know? for sure. It's kind of like a little ACDC meets Aerosmith. Yes, it's because very, I, very hear, I hear rock and roll ain't noise pollution in that, mm -hmm. in that riff. And again, I'm like, it's not like they're stealing it, but I, you know. I fucking hear it, and it sounds really yeah, good. Yeah, it's all about the attitude, you know? It's like, I totally. just, we all just want to, like, play some sexier rock and roll. Like, a lot of the rock and roll today is, like, very fucking, like, stale, mm -hmm. drop D, like, fucking dark guitars and shit. And it's just not, it's not who I am, man. Like, I love Robert Plant, Steven Tyler, and Jagger, and Chris Cornell is obviously a little darker, but, um, you know, that f more fun, sexy shit is, is my wheelhouse. And that's, you know, not, not what I necessarily want to bring back in like a revival sort of sense, but it's just the spirit of like wanting to fuck, I guess, and like dance and fucking party and yeah. have a couple drinks and have a good time. You know, it's, and then, you know, there's, my, I think the Chris Cornell like sort of influence comes off a little bit more in, in Scars and it's a little darker and more minor and shit. You just took so. the words out of my mouth. That was the next thing I was going to yeah. say. Yeah, so. You can clearly hear it. You got that grunge and a little bit of a Sabbath sound in there, which to me is where a lot of grunge came from. But yeah, totally hear that in Scars. Um, another song on your album while we're talking about it is Down the Road which is a little more bluesy. And you know, you're, you talked about your voice before, and I would rather hear somebody that's got a unique voice than a voice that can do side person stuff, all right? Mm -hmm. So it's, I almost hear like a little bit of Janis Joplin in there. In your voice on yeah. that song. You well, know, you're she's, wailing. She's a huge influence on, uh, on Steven. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, that's in there for sure. I mean, I, I definitely listen to a lot of Jop and stuff. Um, but, you know, like uh, other heroes are like Sam Cooke and, you know, Otis Redding. I went pretty deep into you. Sam Cooke was a big one, though. And now, how did you get turned on to that stuff? Was that going into your parents' record collection as well? Or did you just say, hey, and start to dig into stuff? That, that was stuff. more of a recent um, discovery. Um, I just... I don't, yeah, I don't really know, actually. Sam Cook, I think a buddy, you know, was, we, we would just drive around L.A. a little bit and, like, listen to old tunes. He had some old cassettes. He, he drives, like, a super old Mercedes, so he's got a cassette player still. And uh, <laughs> he popped in Sam Cook live from the Coke, but he's like, what do you think about this? And I was like, I fucking love this shit, man. This is awesome. Another thing I want to ask you about your vocals. Where do you write all your own vocals? Do I write them all? Yeah. Yes. And where do yeah, you get inspiration? Where do you come up with the songs? It's mostly just living, living a life, man. I'm, I'm really big on experiencing life to the fullest. Like, I, I have no problem, you know, on a day off or a couple of days off, whatever, going out and going camping on the motorcycle and just meeting people and sharing, you know, some sort of a journey. I have a buddy, um, that I ride with all the time, uh, you know, who, who's an artist as well. And he lives a really full, vibrant life. And, you know, whenever we have time off, we try and go somewhere. And we had like two weeks off uh, before this run. And I went to, shit, where'd I go? I went to Switzerland and Italy and, you know, tried to um, see something cool. You, but you never know what, is around the corner and you never know like there's something that happens when you're like uh, like here's a long there's a long stretch of road and like your your brain just has to like 
make its own radio station and yeah. that's like that that's where a lot of ideas and stuff come up and if something's good i'll pull over and i'll record it into my phone and keep going and bring it to the band you know a month later and be like, oh you know there's this fucking idea i had like when i was on top of a mountain in switzerland or whatever and i think it's pretty cool like what do you guys think you know and we'll expand on it okay but um you know and then at the same time though the boys are at home writing riffs and shit and i'll get emails um with riffs and take a listen to them and try and remember them on the ride and try and write to one of their ideas you know and send them stuff is stuff is always like flying back and forth and then you get on the road and you get to sound check and you start working stuff out mm. which is cool and and then uh but lyrically though yeah i'm all about just experience life like whether it's heartache or, or falling in love or, you know, going down a wrong path, getting into some trouble or, you know, having a little too much of something might, you know, for, for better or for worse, like you experience something and it, it fuels like lyrical content um, in a way that, you know, sitting at home obviously doesn't. Right. I, I know that. Yeah, that's for sure. So now, my my take on when a band is really fucking good is when you watch them play acoustically. And I've seen a couple of videos of you guys at radio stations playing acoustically, and you guys fucking nail it. You fucking nail yeah. it. And I said, that is the sign of a good band. When you can put the four of them on stools and go, okay, play those fucking songs that you did in the studio. And you guys yep. do it, and I'm like, these guys got it, man. If you guys can cut it acoustically, which to me is always the sign of a great band. Yeah, if you can, if you can strip anything down and make it sound good, that's a a good sign for sure. And everybody's a super talented musician on their own, so it's it's um, a recipe for success. I would I would say, you know, and, and I actually really like doing the radio thing because I feel like a lot of people don't come off too well when you strip it down. Mm -hmm. um, I agree, yeah. You know, and, and if you can go in there and really deliver, um, you know, you really come off well, which is cool. We just did one in Boston that, like, kicked ass. Like I saw it. Yeah, they fucking, they were so appreciative to have a great rock and roll band in a rock station, you know, and we had some you know we obviously have some roots from the northeast and um the dj carrie was just like this is fucking what i've been waiting for for a long time so <laughs> so now you i imagine at this point in time because of the success are going full speed ahead you're staying out on the road are things getting really fucking crazy are things moving too fast for you how are you doing with all this shit yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, it's what I've been waiting for my entire life, you know, it's for this thing to finally break. So um, it's it's the culmination of a fucking ton of hard work, a ton of laying my own ass on the line, like time and time again, to, to make sure we can get to this point. And, you know, we're really loving every I had a moment here in the middle of nowhere, and I'm looking out the window and like a, a smile like came across my face, you know, knowing that I'm exactly where I've always wanted to be and I couldn't be happier really yes. right now it's um it's it's just really vindicating and you have a sense of self-worth and accomplishment that you know you never you always wanted to have but you know you never know if so um you know we're grateful that people care and people are interested in, in our band you know and uh hope it stays that way for a long time yeah well and it's good to hear your management's looking out for you like that you know yeah they, they're great and he's a fucking legend and couldn't ask for a better manager or better person you know it's it's good that we're friends you know we've always been friends first going to hockey games mm -hmm. doing our thing and having a social life but um when this thing needed a professional um to sort of guide us um it was good to have a friend in our corner that really had our best interests um at heart and and it's you know, we've been offered a lot of record deals and shit, and um, we, we're still unsigned. And I was going to ask just, you that. Yeah, you you just haven't found the right the right fit, the right offer. I, I don't know, man. It's like uh, 
you know, our, our manager was there when nobody else was, and none of the labels were. Um, I just don't, you know, we all don't really know what to do. I don't know what anybody could say that's going to make me want to sign over all the, the, the masters and shit to a label. I just don't, at this point, you know, I just don't know what they could do to really help. Um, I don't know. It's, you know, we, we take every meeting. If somebody really blows us away, I'm sure we'll, we'll do it. But um, it just hasn't been the case yet, so. Well, good. Then I'm glad you're holding out for what's right because, hey, right now you guys are doing fine on your own. And when yeah, I found out fine. you didn't have a label, I was like, fuck, really? I'm like, damn, yeah. these dudes are doing really good, man, for not having a label. For not having you know, a label. And it's, you'd like to have some more money, but, um, you know, we did a record fucking number in merch the other night in Seattle. And, like, Seattle was awesome. I mean, what a, it's not a better rock and roll town in the country. Um, and, you know, it's like, you know, you, you sign with somebody, you sign a lot of that away too. So it's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, I don't know, it's all sketchy to me. I'm skeptical. Well, good. And that's how you and should until, be. And until I'm not, I'm going to be, you know, and, and uh, I think um, that's how it should be. You should, should want to, should want to have a, uh, a great partner. Like it's, I should feel confident in, in a partnership with a label and, and we all should. And until we do, you know, we're not going to take any, a bad risk. Good. You got your head in the right place, Mark, and I really like hearing that, man. But in the meantime, I'm going to be rocking to the album. I'm going to be playing it on my show. And again, Mark, thank you so much, man. And a pleasure to talk to you. You got your head in the right place and keep it that way. Same to you, man. I appreciate the time and uh, you take care. All right, man. Talk soon. Later, bud. All right, bye.